Welcome to At the Epicenter's special edition at the Arise Music Festival. We're really excited to be here and thank you for coming and thank you to each of you for joining at the Epicenter for this special edition. So I'm honored to have with me some very inspiring individuals who have each been working on a variety of projects in the social mission arena of entrepreneurship. So um, I'm asking each of our speakers to share a little bit about who they are. But I will um, first give a little shout out to appreciate our underwriters and all of the folks working on the Arise Festival, which is a, a loving endeavor. And we're super impressed with the incredible crowds here at the festival. And I want to just give a shout out to our underwriters for their support of At the Epicenter, New Hope Natural Media, Padrone Social Marketing, Compass Natural, Boulder Brands, Nature's Path Foods, PAX World Investments, Kehi, and Print Experts. So we're very grateful for their support. And without much further ado, um, I'm going to start to this person on my right. Left, right is challenging for me sometimes. Um, Joshua, would you say a little bit about who you are and what your business is? Yes, I'm Joshua Scott Onisco, and I'm the founder of Pangea Organics, and we make organic and fair trade skin and body care. When did you start your company? 2000. 2000, excellent. Lisa. Uh, my name is Lisa Turner. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Holy Bites, and we make grain-free snacks in the paleo space. Thank you, Lisa. Justin. I'm Justin Bly with Guayaki Yerba Mate. I manage sales for the central US, and we make organic fair trade Yerba Mate beverages and loose leaf. Thank you. Linda. Linda Apolipsius of Titulia Organic Teas. We source our teas from our own tea garden in northern Bangladesh. So it's single source, sustainably grown uh, organic teas. Um, started about six years ago. I'm Chris Fuel, the founder and president of WB Kitchen. We make uh, honey sweetened treats, uh, specifically nut bars and cookies. So. Thank you. I'm Selene Diaris, and I'm the executive director of At the Epicenter, and we produce a speaker series where we have um, interactive conversations with businesses, business leaders in, I would call it, the, the green business space. So thank you for being here. And the title of today's event is Do Well by Doing Good, Social, Why Social Entrepreneurship Matters. So I wanted to start sort of right on that concept of social entrepreneurship and what is the possibility of that in our world of business as usual versus this other notion for how business can be a force for good. I want to start with the question as this is kind of set up as a roundtable discussion. Is business as a force for good a, a realizable truth or is it just some happy thoughts? Who wants to grab that one first? <laughs> I think it's a force for good. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, I think, and, and in particular, I think consumer products are, are a very effective way to um, to educate and to change consumer behavior. So we have a tea company, Organic Teas. Um, you know, we use our packaging, we use every interaction that we have with the consumer to let people know, you know, what tea is, to let people know more about organic farming, to let people know how important it is that tea is organic. And, um, and again, I think consumer products in particular are so useful because it's, it's an accessible way. It's something that people um, abroad the, I mean, it, everyone interacts with them every single day. Um, and so, yeah, so a particularly useful vehicle. Excellent. And what about some of the other thoughts on social mission and business as a force for good? One of the things that, I mean, obviously I think business can be a force for good, but one of the, the interesting things about creating a brand and creating the DNA of that brand is that the concept that 70% of our thoughts are repetitive. So 70% of the thoughts that you had today, you've had multiple times. And a lot of those thoughts come from choices that you made that were probably not the right choices. You know, mm -hmm. So you have regret and remorse that consume our brains. And what I love about creating conscious products is that it's giving the world the opportunity 
to make a better choice for themselves, for the planet, for their families, you know, for every, all stakeholders involved. And so the strongest vote that we have is the one we have with our dollar. And when you decide to engage and create a brand and make that offering of your concept of a better choice to the world, you give people the opportunity to make that better choice and therefore decrease repetitive thought. So you're actually helping create a new muscle in the mind to exercise in the marketplace? Something like that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or less thought. Less thought, more good? <laughs> don't think, feel. Ah, don't think, feel. All right. I feel good. What about you, Lisa? You know, I, I liked what Linda said about that, that um, the idea of a consumer product is a, can be a really powerful platform. And, you know, there's, it doesn't have to be a charity or a corporation. I think that right now we're seeing a lot of really beautiful hybrids between the two. And I, if, if you have a charity, if you have a social enterprise, it's just a social enterprise. It doesn't necessarily have a product behind it. I think it, it can only go so far. I think people don't respond in the same way when you're, you're just constantly asking for handouts and you know, this is like the charity, the idea is, that, oh, can I just have some more money? Thank you. Um, when you have a product behind it and you sell a product, when you approach people and you say, hey, you have a problem and I have this product that's gonna solve it and make you happy. And by the way, I am also doing this in the world and I'm gonna take some of your dollars and I'm gonna put them to this good use. I think it's a really powerful message. So um, that's the kind of thing where, I, again, I feel like the hybrid right now, we're seeing more and more companies do it, where they're combining the two and it doesn't have to be one or the other. I like that. That's a strong theme that we hold very dear is just practicing the art of service and connection and that is essential to our mission, which is based in acres and jobs and reforestation, but today those are the metrics and really it's more of creating healthy communities and empowering those, the local communities in South America who are able to keep some of the last 3% of forest that's remaining there. And that's our vision to create those healthy communities in South America and North America and beyond wherever we choose to work. Can you say a little bit more about what Guayaquil does on the ground to facilitate that type of healthy community from how you're sourcing your raw ingredients? Absolutely. We've got three forest projects, one's in Brazil, one's in Argentina, and one's in Paraguay, um, totaling about 70,000 acres now. And sadly, it is um, just little pockets of forest that remain in about 3% of what was there in 1970. So we're partnered with the indigenous farmers in planting yerba mate in an agroforestry model and reforesting those degraded forests with native hardwood trees. Um, and they're able to build schools and maintain their cultural identity and create a healthier forest. That's awesome. We're excited about it. I think that's great. And just a, a quick inter, in, intersection here. If you're watching us on live stream and if you have any questions, uh, do uh, use at the epicenter on Twitter and include uh, business for the number four good as your hashtag. Um, Chris, did you want to ch chime in on the social good potential of business? Yeah, I, I really think that um, nowadays there's, I mean, there's room for a couple different types of products. I find there's the products that's just the product, and then there's a product with an identity that people can attach to and create an emotional bond with. And I, and I, I, um, I feel. Um, as, as ways like younger people want that attachment, you know, they just don't want, I mean, you go down the grocery aisles, it's the same stuff when you were a kid. It's like, and we just have this explosion of neat things happening. There's room for it and there's a demand for it. And there's, uh, I mean, there's opportunity for jobs and just uh, creating that space, I think is in, uh, something that doesn't exist and just manifesting it in this world. And it's been a lot of fun. That's cool. And I yes. just want to say, too, a force for good also sort of going upstream. <clears throat> so all of our companies setting an example for other companies, um, you know, better, cleaner tea cultivation, you know, cleaner food, cosmetics. And um, 
you know, and I think that's super impactful. We're a B Corp. I don't know if any of the others are, are B Corps, but okay. yeah, we Great, you guys are B Corp. You know, so that's, you know, just, just this really beautiful growing movement of businesses large and small um, who are, you know, being audited in the way that they're running their companies from the environmental to the social side. Um, so yeah, so I think we, we also, just the, the overall business industry um, are making an impact. I would agree, and I, I thought something that Chris, you just sort of touched on, I would use the term right livelihood. So when you're creating companies that have this broader palette of intention, it creates also an opportunity for people to be working inside of an organization where they can potentially feel more purposeful in what they do. How have you, um, now we have different size businesses here. So Joshua, you guys are, have grown quite a bit over the, did you say 2000 is when it 2000. all began? 2000, correct. So you have a, a team, and Guayaquil is obviously a big team, and then we have some smaller companies. So in balancing, how do you see in your workforce that you're creating meaningful employment or engagement? I think a lot of it is creating a place that no matter where the chaos is, people are excited to come to work. Because, <clears throat> you know, we spend, I don't know, something like 50% of our hours doing something to create financial return for ourselves. And if you wake up and you're not excited about where you're going, even if your plate is full and you're doing nine jobs, quit, <laughs> leave, like go do something else because life is, is too short to spend 50% of your time working for something that you don't believe in, mm -hmm. that doesn't appreciate you, that doesn't respect you. That, you know, people are always saying, well, what are you earning? I'm like, how does it make you feel? Like when you come home, <laughs> you know, do you feel energized, amazing, awake, tuned in, or do you just feel emotionally drained mm -hmm. and used? So at Pangea, you guys have sort of a bullpen set up for your staff. What are some of the things that you have employed to engage your team and create, um, you know, camaraderie among your staff? I took them all skydiving last spring. That was pretty fun. You did? Yeah. Wow. Just the look on their face when they hit the ground, like. <laughs> That's awesome, <laughs> skydiving. And don't you guys have a softball team? We do, Pangea Panthers. Go Panthers. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, you know, one of the things that, that was really interesting is I haven't played softball since I was nine. And last year we decided to create the Pangea Panthers in the rec league, and we lost every single game. We were so bad. But the, the, the uh, what do you call them, umpires always came up to us, they're like, you guys are so bad, except you have more fun than anybody in this entire league. And, uh, but we all encouraged each other and helped each other and sent out YouTube videos how to do different things, like catch, throw, hit, went to the batting cages, bought better beer, you know, all these things. I think and this better year, beer is key. And this year we won every single game except for one and actually came in second place this year. That's great. So it was just this amazing feat of just camaraderie and helping each other and really believing each other and cheering each other on and celebrating the small victories. Because a lot of business is just celebrating the small victories. You don't need to, to get to the top of the mountain. You just need to feel good every moment. That you're taking one step at a time, but you're doing it in tandem with each other. In tandem, just like, was that a skydiving I think it reference? might have been, like yes. Clever, right? Very. Thank you. And so Guayaquil is also a, a bigger organization. How do you guys create, because it sounds like you're sort of in a remote office in Denver. Yeah, and we use the Sebador to the core model, which um, the Sebador is the art of service and connection. And I mean, we really embrace the lifestyle vibe of a company and encourage, you know, you to create your own healthy lifestyle and adventure through the art of sharing mate, which, you know, most of us are surfers or gravity sports enthusiasts, yoginis, and um, we kind of break it down by thirds. You know, you should spend a third of your time practicing connecting with our stakeholders and retailers and where the mate plant wants to go, a third of your time, you know, at music festivals and lifestyle events and then, yeah, out on the wave or on the mountain. So it's just, it's not just a nine to five type of environment. You're 
you're constantly working and sharing, but it's also just a part of your lifestyle. So that's what we encourage and have been able to gather what we feel are the best people to be in service. That's cool. I like the service concept. So with Holy Bites and Tatulia and um, WB Kitchen, you guys all have a staff and team as well. How do you um, create a sense of engagement and connection with your your teams? Um, you know, oh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I just, I, th I thought it was very important to create a space where I felt like individuals could be appropriately challenged uh, just to grow. I mean, it's like we're really here to just kind of like grow as a human being, e evolve our consciousness. And you can do that through any job, but it's like when you have the space and you're getting the responsibility to create and do things, it allows those opportunities of, of stress, which sends you into chaos, but it's like that uh, alchemical reaction and you just grow through it. And uh, I felt it was just important to respect people through that process so they're not being judged, you know, still work. Sometimes you, you're having a bad day and that's okay. I don't need you to put on a smile, you know, like just don't treat people badly and really just have a good time. Uh, it's, if I, I look at it as kind of like as a personality and everyone is always holding a different space within that person, like as we do personally, we rotate through personas or archetypes and it's also as that, see that in the business. And that's been very helpful for me to not need things from people and just let them be themselves and just be like, oh, this person would be very good at this, let's put them there and just build in the confidence to grow in those, those places. So. so it sounds like you're really looking to match a person's proclivities and talents to tasks inside the company that they can really shine doing. Yeah, and a lot of them don't necessarily even know that they're like, whoa, I've never done this before, but it's like, yeah, and you're perfect for this. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That's very cool. Linda or um, Lisa, do you guys want to share? Yeah, you know, um, one thing that I was thinking about when you were asking this question was that for us, our values and our mission are intrinsic to the company and they're intrinsic to who we are. And, and we're a very small company still, but it's, it's not like the values are something you can slap on after the fact like a coat of paint. I mean, for us, it, it has to be woven through every fiber of our company and our mission is like a lot of what Chris said, that the treating people well and health and every single person who works for our company really believes in it. They believe in organic, they believe in healthy food. It's, it's a lifestyle that they all embody. And it's, I mean, it's not like we have people working in the kitchen who then go out and smoke a cigarette and drink a Diet Coke at lunch. Like they all have their homemade food and it's, it's how they live and that's really important. And we have a small team, but we treat our people really well. We're not skydiving yet. We will be soon. That's definitely on the bucket list. I'll push the other people out of the airplane. But, we'll, um, but, but we treat our people well because I feel like I have the people who work in our kitchen. I feel really lucky to have them. They're very talented. And I, I feel like if you have unhappy people, you're not going to make happy food. The food's not going to taste good. So it's of great importance to me as a business owner that the people I work with are happy, that they feel fulfilled, that they feel listened to. Um, we have a lot of flexibility with our hours and we try to work with people and, and meet people where they're at. And, and like Chris said, give them opportunities to do things they might not even think they know how to do. And often, they, we've done that a few times and we found out that you know, some, we throw something at somebody and it turns out like, yeah, you're perfect for that job that you've never done before. I like that, I like that philosophy. Linda. Uh, we don't skydive and we never will. <laughs> I'm terribly afraid of heights. Well, everyone else can go to it. Um, but uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, same thing everyone's saying, just, you know, you got to love what you're doing. Um, you know, and, and my thing too is I want people in my door all the time. Like I want to be hearing from people. And, you know, I feel like if you're coming to work, um, here, you know, you, you've got ideas and, you know, it, it, nobody there is just sort of clocking in and clocking out. Be an active participant. If you have a wacko idea, we want to hear about it. Um, and then it just, then everyone's fully participating and, and the company as a whole benefits more as long as everybody's fully engaged. 
Great. Well, that, I appreciate that conversation because I, I really think that the opportunity to engage in a business environment, whether you're an owner or not, is can you find a place to be seen, uh, respected, and, and create an opportunity for engagement? So I love that each of you are tuned in to that as an important part of what you do. That's really, really impressive. So if we're looking at sort of scale and different sizes of a business and the ability to really tell your story, what would you guys say is um, the opportunity and the challenge within the, the real conveyance of your purpose and mission? How do you accomplish that with a limited budget or a big budget? What are some of the um, creative tools you've engaged in the course of growing your business and then uh, getting to a different stage of your business for really telling your story and also hearing from your um, customers uh, what they're inspired by from you. That's kind of a convoluted question, but take pieces of it that sort of strike you and run with it. Uh, I've kind of noticed that um I mean, we're still relatively small too, but um, we we continue to grow. What I notice is that the more we grow, the more narrow I, that our our definition is becoming, but the more complex that everything beyond that is. But it, of really getting everyone on the same page and the identity very clear. Um, uh, I mean, you don't see. Uh, brands with multiple identities and stuff it's like what what are you who are you and so and then in a, in a way it is it is still a part of you but it seems like it gets uh, smaller and smaller what you point out i remember kind of what you're projecting out and um I don't know if that makes sense. That's been really true for black key <laughs> it's been a process of simplification and mm -hmm. amplification the whole time and just um you know there's a lot to know about this plant that we've done a lot of confusing over the years and so just streamlining and being authentic and just you know loving your lifestyle and then sharing it within it has been essential to our success mm -hmm. because as a like as a almost as like a product okay so it's pretty static you know this the tea it's that's what it is but it, we as humans are constantly changing so how do you still you, you, you know, it's like people cycle through, again, you know, different hobbies, different patterns, and, but you still have this product and how can I still apply it? And that, that simpling the concept down, but making it also broad enough to encompass you as an individual, as like the society as a whole that some people can grasp to and that you can still appreciate and be authentic with. So. So we, um, yeah, we suffer from the same problem is we've got all this great stuff to say and, you know, and still, still are working on refining our, our message as well. But, um, I mean, we've used our packaging, um, you know, so somewhat disruptive packaging. I mean, it looks, looks different. The tone of voice, the format um, is different. It's this cardboard canister. It's all compostable. Um, that, quite frankly, is, is our biggest marketing piece. You know, we look different. Um, and, and Joshua, you're actually our inspiration for our packaging, so thank you. I know. <laughs> um, and uh, that, and then, you know, now we're going, we're going back and going, a uh, lot more demos, just going back, you know, and I know everyone here is big on that because we all have story. We are all trying to get people to think about these products in different ways, and the only way you can do it is having this conversation. Um, and just the, the final thing that we've done, too, is um, we're starting to grow uh, our business in colleges and universities, and that's been really interesting, to your point, that the kids of today, but I mean, it's, you know, there is such an interest in knowing your product, and, and in the colleges in particular, um, the engagement and the opportunity to have that conversation and, and having the demand, you know, coming for, for products uh, that they can believe in and with a story and sustainability message um, is, is really resonating. So that's, that's been really, uh, um, really satisfying, actually, to, to go into that, that route. So I would like for you to take that moment to dive a little deeper into the story of Tatulia because it's a really incredible story of what happened in Bangladesh in this area um, that was in a very bad way. And so if you would be so kind as to share a little bit about what that bigger story is. 
Well, I'd love to. Thank you, Slate. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, Titulia is, uh, we have our own tea garden in northern Bangladesh. Um, I got involved with this, my business partner, Anis Ahmed, and his family. Uh, they're from Bangladesh, and they have other businesses in the country, and in around 2000, they, um, all the boys who had, been, who had been educated in the States came back home, wanted to do a new business or start a new business that was going to give back as much as possible uh, to the land and the people. So they decided that a tea garden uh, was a way that they could have the, the most impact. So Bangladesh, um, anyone here ever been to Bangladesh? <laughs> All right, Woo. we'll have to talk. Um, so Bangladesh is in sort of the northeast, um, just off the northeast part of India. Um, it's a tiny country with a massive population and is one of the poorest countries in the world. The north of Bangladesh is the poorest part of one of the poorest parts, uh, countries of the world. Um, this part of the country was actually turning into a desert. Bangladesh is actually known for monsoons and floods, but the northern part of the country, um, through this rock lifting, so they would, uh, people would go in and take rocks for construction, destroy the topsoil, and when you look at these Google images of nine, you know, 1995, it was turning into a desert. Um, and so my partners came in and using, uh, you know, natural farming methods, uh, Masanobu Fukuoka, and uh, biodynamic methods, um, went in and restored the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, what we're doing, it's not sustainable, it's restorative and regenerative. So it's actually brought species back and water bodies that had disappeared are coming back. Um, so it's having a, a tremendously positive impact on the environment, then on the society and the, and the community and the economy. Um, you know, our t the women who work in the garden, and it's mostly women, um, it's just a job. And, and I know this doesn't sound like much, but it's it's a job. It's not indentured servitude. It's not um, you know the situation at most tea gardens where that really is is actually the fact on the ground. Um, everyone goes home at night. Um, women get paid directly. Again, all of these things don't sound like much. These are all really unique in the industry. Um, and then the. Uh, the, the cornerstone of our social model is we loan cows to women in the community, and they repay those cows with cow dung that we use for compost. So it's this beautiful symbiotic uh, relationship where everyone's benefiting, um, and and it's helping our you know our garden grow uh, as well. So that's that's the origin of the garden, and then just on the actual product side of it, it's tea from a new region. Um, you know, no tea has ever gotten out. <laughs> no tea that's grown in Bengal. Bangladesh. Um, so this is a super, you know, high quality, premium, 100% organic tea. The, the flavor profile is unique because it's a new, a different region. Um, and then just the last thing, and I'll stop rambling, um, is the packaging. So all of our packaging is compostable and biodegradable. Um, it's great if you're doing all this great stuff at Origin, but, you know, it's important that everybody who's consuming the product uh, gets the same, um, you know, authenticity of, of what we're doing. So it's all compostable and biodegradable as well. No strings, tags, or staples. Um, and uh, yeah. That's great. That's, That's a beautiful yeah. story. <laughs> Thank you. I drank it. Yes. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> so, OK, so we're, we're kind of in this storytelling of what are the different virtues. So I'm, I'm interested in sort of the virtuousness, because I, I like to talk about uh, the virtuous cycle inside of um, a company and its products, because as we've already been pointing, it's not just the end result. It's the interior experience of the staff. It's the sourcing and how you're choosing um, to find product on the planet and bring it into your product. And Joshua, you have some great stories from sourcing um, seaweed, I think was one of, I remember a video you guys did a while back. But would you like to share some of the um, evolution within Pangea? Because you guys have been, um, from the outset, being very conscious about your sourcing. Yeah. So. I started Pangea after backpacking around the world for several years. So, you know, one of the things I realized from traveling at first was that 87% of our food, of our agricultural products, are grown by women. And they still, to this day, only own 1% of the world's land, which is kind of a mind boggling concept to think about. And so, when I moved back to Boulder and started Pangea, one of my main goals was to try to create as many connections with the people that were growing our ingredients. And it takes 
several million acres of land in 52 different countries to grow all of our ingredients. And you know, when I, when I first started Pangea, I was making bar soap and selling at the Boulder Farmer's Market, and people would come up to me and say, why would I, why would I buy in a bar of organic soap? Like, why would I care about what I'm putting on my body? Well, it's like, there's two reasons. One, your skin's absorbing 87% of what you put on it, so if you wouldn't eat it, you shouldn't put it in your skin, because if you took all the pores on your body and pushed them together, it's the size of your mouth. It's a good visual. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. But the, the more important thing is, every, like we were talking about earlier, every time you make a purchase, you're making a decision to either positively or negatively impact the world around you and yourself. And so I said, you know, when you're going in the shower at this bar soap, you are positively affecting 17 different communities around the world that are growing these ingredients to make this product. Now, yeah, you can go buy a bar soap for 99 cents and it's made of sodium tallowate and palm oil and causing rainforest deforestation and the depletion of the orangutan population. Or you can buy this and you're gonna smell better. So, I mean. But smelling better is key. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's again, it comes back to that creating something that allows someone to make a better decision. Cool, thank you. And I, I love the, the mouth symbol of the pores. Yeah. That's really powerful. Well, we're absorbing so, we, you know, the average American puts on 450 chemicals on their body a day, a day. And so people always say to me, oh, but you know, I buy everything natural. And I was like, but what you don't know is if something has a fragrance or a perfume, that's 200 chemicals that aren't listed. You know, if in, in 72% of the brands that are on the market don't even list all their ingredients. Mm. So you still don't know what you're getting, you know? So you have to find, and this, and I think everyone on this panel is doing a great job of creating brands that people can actually trust. You know, because you have to trust what you're buying. If you don't trust them, it's like not trusting your best friend, except you're paying money for them every day, you know? And isn't your industry isn't regulated, right? Or isn't there's really it's like light regulation? like the wild, wild west. Right, so. Everyone I mean, thinks it's reg isn't. regulated, but it's, it's not at all. You know, so it's, it really has to come down to trusting the brands that you decide to support and use. There's a great video um, created by, isn't it Safe Cosmetics, about the um, cosmetic body care industry and how it's a self-regulated industry. And self-regulation is sort of a silly term because if it's cheaper to source something that has a negative impact, oh well, you know, we're gonna make our product um, so our margin can be as fat as possible and if it has a consequence, that's you, the individual consumer's problem. And the, the impact that you're talking about with chemicals on the body is so important and um, as well as what we put into our mouths through the food that we eat. It's like what we put on. It's a very, very important connection that I think most of us aren't really taught a very good um, information about our bodies and how these things impact us. So having to educate has been a big part, I would imagine, of your mission as a company as well. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. One of the things I was thinking of as you were talking is it, it also comes down to you know your body and you were gifted this body to walk around earth and to be able to dance all night and hug hundreds of people and spray toner on people and what do we decide to do with this body do we wake up in the morning and anoint it with organic nutritious high mineral content high vitamin content oils that are nourishing our body or are we just going to wash it with you know, cocomyl propyl betaine and sodium lauryl sulfate. And, Yum. Yeah, <laughs> sodium hydromethyl glycinate. Or do you want coconut oil and lavender and myrtle oil? <laughs> you know, myrtle for me, baby. Definitely myrtle. <laughs> Double down on the myrtle. Double down. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I can't even say those other words. And if I can't pronounce it, it's bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. You know, when, when Joshua was talking, I was thinking about um, the question that Linda asked about it's a self-regulated industry and it's the wild, wild west. And it's, um, you know, in a lot of ways, even the food industry isn't regulated as well as it could be. You don't have to tell where your ingredients came from. You don't have to give all the details. And so that's where I feel like um, companies that do have a strong mission and a purpose 
and have a, a, a good value structure have the opportunity to sort of set the, the bar a little bit higher for other companies. Um, just by virtue of, of being in the competitive marketplace, at some point, everybody's going to have to jump on this bandwagon. Because I don't, I don't think that this is going away. Um, I was also thinking about what Linda said and the idea of sustainability is really just one piece of it. But the bigger piece is restorative and regenerative. Because, I mean, the bottom line for all of us is every decision we make, we're either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. And when, when we started Holy Bites, our goal was to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Because the, the one thing that we did not want to do, obviously, was just put another crappy snack out on the market with propylene glycol and you know, all that other stuff in there. But we also didn't, we didn't really want to put another organic junk food product on the market with a lot of refined ingredients and canola oil and um, you know, refined sugar that may be organic, but it's still refined sugar. And that's where we, we wanted to be really careful about our ingredients. And for us, it came down to, to being willing to, to tell a story. And that's where that edu ed the education piece comes in, where we can start to restore and regenerate through telling our story and through educating people and letting people know, like, why would you choose this instead of this? And what am I really getting? Why am I paying more for this product? And it's, it's a good story to tell, and it's the kind of thing that people don't automatically know. So would you share a little bit about that story? You know, what would be some of the, the, the uh, cornerstones of the Holy Bite story, of the products that you're bringing to market? Um, I'm, m my background is um, I'm a chef and a nutritionist and a culinary arts instructor and a food writer. And so I've been in this world of food for about thir almost 30 years. I'm quite old. And... Um, <laughs> Um, I started when I was six, so. <laughs> but um, it, I, so I see I see what's going on out there. I also I grew up in West Virginia and North Carolina, and you grew up in North Carolina. So so I grew up with the problem. I mean, those two states have among the highest rates of, of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity in the country, and it's it's not really getting a lot better. So in spite of the fact that we have all these natural, organic, healthy foods on the market, the, the fact is, is that there's not that much that's changed. So um, one of the things that we really looked at is what's, what is it that we really want to be doing? And for us, it was clean. It was putting a clean product out there without anything processed. People eat about 25% of their daily calories as snacks. So why not introduce a snack that's nutritious, that's going to make some changes, and that's going to allow people to get some nutrition as a snack? Um, we're, we're quite small as a company, so our challenge, of course, has been getting that story out there. But you know, this is something that I feel really passionate about, and I feel like even as a small company, you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to donate or to, to um, dedicate to a social marketing or a a social enterprise fund, that it just becomes a matter of looking at, you know, basically you have time or you have money. Those are your two resources and what are ways that you can use them. So that is another important part of our story is just the way that we've been trying to find creative ways to help even at this small early stage. Cool. Thank you. So um, Guayaquil started when exactly? Do you Circa 1995. 95. I thought it was a while. So can you share a little bit about sort of the beginning, the story of how did Guayaquil come into existence? You're not one of the founders, but you've been with the company for a long time. I think one of the founders lives up in Netherland in, here in no, Colorado. That's, that's no? Samazon. That's Samazon? Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm confused. All part of the same crew, though. Well, there yeah. you go. It's a good, virtuous family. Yeah. No, they're a great sister company. We love those guys. Um, yeah, it was uh, David Carr and Alex Pryor. It was a student project at Cal Poly. And uh, Alex is the Argentine co-founding partner and was the first one to bring Mate up from Argentina and share it at Cal Poly. And uh, it was just an easy conversion from other caffeines. I mean, they were, you know, out surfing and it quickly became their fuel of choice. And um, part of their student project was to create a sustainable business model. So they coined the 
market-driven restoration that we still hold as our business model. And the vision is that the global yerba mate culture will continue to power our market-driven restoration business model through reforestation and in turn creating healthy communities. And it's, it was essentially just uh, the co-founder and our journeyman, Don Miguel, who were out in a van and traveling around the country to all the natural food stores, setting up a, a, a cebador stand and sharing mate, and um, slowly grew into just selling our loose leaf and then our tea bags. And then about 10 years into it, we launched the first uh, old smoky bottles that were barely palatable and you had to really love mate and wanting it to get through one and I mean they're very effective but <laughs> we've uh, streamlined and you know reformulated constantly and have you know, fine-tuned the process for you know the past 10 years where the beverages have entered the market and really have indicated that that is you know a very that's the high velocity you know that's where the the revenue comes from the loose leaf and the culture is essential to drawing people in and there's a big conversion between you know people that are introduced to the yerba mate category through a can or bottle and then will gravitate towards brewing it themselves and developing their own relationship with the plant and i think historically there's been like a lack of space to make an intimate choice in consumer products to you know put something good for you and the planet and your body and just really visioning to create that space to make that intimate choice, especially when it's a, a psychoactive plant, you know, it's a big decision. So creating that really clean, the cleanest mate that is, you know, good for you, good for the planet and regenerating forest and regenerating, you know, your own health. You said it has a psychoactive component? Well, it's what is that? It's caffeine oh, and the theobromine. Caffeine. Yeah, oh, there's a trifecta of alkaloids. Well, I was like all excited. <laughs> you can still be excited. <laughs> I am excited. Can, you'll be excited. Oh, yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, cool. So, is there something any of you want to sort of chew on in in this conversational style that we haven't talked about so far that you think is important to? the social mission element of doing business. Well, how about this? Um, <laughs> it is my job, I was, I was just testing. We're looking to you. I know, right. So climate change, it's obviously hugely impactful. Um, how would you say each of you, what you're up to is part of that story, either on the, you know, we're, we're part of the, the contributing not to increasing climate change, but we're being conscious of our carbon footprint. We're being conscious in our sourcing um, to that end. How, how are you each looking at these sorts of bigger, bigger issues impacting society? I think a, a big realization for me when it came down to, um, I, I actually don't like the word sustainability because who wants to sustain? I want to thrive. Mm. So the whole kind of sustain means just staying in the same place, which we can't do, obviously. Right. Um, was the day that I stopped saying, it's them doing this, it's them doing that. It's like, I'm part of this, right? And so if the more that I wake up and my consciousness is saying, oh my God, all these people, the, the righties, the Republicans, the this, that, and the other thing, is less time that I'm, I'm focusing on the fact that I am part of this, and we all say we are one, but do we actually believe that? When it comes down to environmental choices, political choices, we have to take ownership. We're all creating this giant storm, right? So we can wake up and say, I'm part of this, and just because I'm part of it, I can also be part of the solution. Exactly. So, and the, um, there you go, <laughs> I love it. What about with, how are you guys looking at the issue of climate change and spritzing? It's toning, technically. Toning, it's toning. I'm readjusting the pH of my sebaceous glands. Okay, nice. <laughs> climate change or, you know, the weather. So we, I mean, it, it, as I said before, I mean, we're, um, we've 
definitely committed to that, committed to um, building tea gardens and in places where that we're turning into deserts, which is having a huge impact. Um, on the pesticide thing, um, that's something too where we're starting, you know, we're definitely having more conversations about that. And I think tea is an interesting um, vehicle to have that conversation because people, they say, I drink tea. Drink, tea is natural and inherently natural and organic. And yes, tea is great and tea is very, very good for you and has great health properties. But most tea and most, I, I mean, 95 probably percent, to, percent of the tea category is conventionally or chemically grown. And it's infused with pesticides at least twice during its eight-day growing cycle. And the first time it's washed is when it's in your cup, where it's reconstituted most of the pesticides being banned in the States. Um, so that's something. So it matters. It matters to the planet. It matters to the women who are plucking the tea. It matters um, to you and your children who are enjoying tea that you are drinking a cup of pesticides. Um, so that's, that's an area that, you know, I think we're, you know, we're, 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 our practices are good and we are also just trying to educate people so that their buying decisions um, can support uh, organic and natural farming. Um, so as, as we've grown, we've had to be able to procure ingredients to, to, to grow and that requires dealing with people who are farming on more of a mass production, pr production whatnot. And, uh, so obtaining certifications as far as like non-GMO, organic, fair trade, in a way it does promote a healthier farming methods and it creates the demand for these organic ingredients, which will make people want to grow them organically because they know they can obtain a higher price for it. And um, I, f I feel like just supporting that movement is uh, really big. And I, I do find within the United States, there's resistance. Uh, of if you want to keep your, uh, I mean, local anymore is like, I would say the US. If you say, I want a local product or something, it's, you're sourcing within the US. But I think that's even difficult to find high quality organic s things that aren't being sprayed with, you know, the soy crops next door that are just being demolished with uh, fertilizers and, and and pesticides is just killing everything off. It's like the, the food system, it's like the deader the food is, the safer it is, you know? <laughs> and that's not the case around the, the rest of the world, you know? It's like they spend a lot of money on their food. I mean, most of my disposal income goes to food. I love to eat, I want it to taste good. And uh, I think in, in America that, that there is a, sh a shift in that, whereas before it was just about convenience, just about feeding you, um, you know? You, you spend your money on other types of things. And I think it really, ideally, you, and body products, you know, anything you're feeding this body, this is what you're using. Do right, well. and that does have a tie-in to, you know, regenerative agriculture is organic agriculture. So all the points that you all have been making about the sourcing, how is this produced? How does this have this bigger impact on climate? There's a really, amazing study um, by the Rodale Institute. It is a 35 year long on the ground uh, study of what's happening to soils when they're conventionally growing crops versus growing them organically. And now after 35 years of research, the evidence is absolutely compelling that conventional agriculture destroys the living organisms in the soil. And it turns out that those living organisms in the soil, by nature's grand design, have a capacity to hold carbon. And we have been destroying, through all sorts of activities, the soil under our feet, which happens to have this extraordinary function of pulling carbon out of the air and holding it in the soil. So what I think you're going to start hearing a lot more of in the next few years as we move into the um, event happening up in Paris this December and going into 2016, you're going to be hearing the phrase regenerative agriculture a lot. And the story there is our carbon problem is really a problem that's very solvable in a very straightforward, beautiful way, which is using the technology of that the planet came with 
automatically that we've been operating against. And so the fact that each of you are running businesses that are actually sourcing and supporting organic agriculture around the world, you're part of the solution. And it's we as the, I don't like the word consumer, but as citizens making the choice to invest our purchasing decision in such a way that we are solution oriented versus problem, part of the problem. So the whole possibility with business and that each of you are playing this role in what you do, uh, driving the behavior in our marketplace towards the products that you're creating and our other fellows in the market who are also a part of this equation. We just have to grow because overall, we're still a tiny part of the story, despite the mightiness of our vision and the mightiness of our hearts and intentions. So given what I just shared, I'm curious, what do you see as the galvanizing potential and force for getting the products that you're making, as well as the others within this um, field of the organic fair trade world. How do we take the market on in a way that changes the dynamic substantially and ongoing? Ideas? I mean, I think we're already doing it. Yeah. That's A. <laughs> B, I mean, one, one of the big realizations is that all the huge multinational corporations, they, you know, they don't follow trends, they follow dollars. The dollars just happen to be part of the trends. So what we're all doing is creating brands that are eating up part of the market. And they're watching it, and that's why we're seeing all these mass brands come out with organic potato chips and organic, I think organic Oreos came out. And it's not exactly what I want to see in the world, but I'm glad that the outer part of that Oreo is non-GMO, organic, whatever the hell it is. You know, I'm not going to eat it, but we're changing the way they think about the world. I mean, the great thing about startup companies and innovative companies is that we're creating a want in the market that people didn't know existed. You know, and so the market follows that. And so the impact that we're having on the greater scheme of things is monumental. It's much bigger than we probably think about it from day to day. But I remember, uh, I think it was 2007, Pangea had created biodegradable plantable packaging that you could stick our bar soap packaging in the ground and uh, basil would come up and now it's trees. And I was giving a talk at the Sustainable Packaging Coalition blah 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 somewhere in Florida and uh, the CMO from uh, PepsiCo was there. Mm. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, uh, I wanna let you know that your packaging has been in our design room for six months. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> My soapbox made it to PepsiCo and they're thinking about using molded fiber to redesign their six packs. And just imagine the impact of that. Wow. The tens of millions of trees, you know? So every better decision you're making in a little business and that not, might not be about your growth. Right. You know, don't have attachment to your own outcome. Have attachment to the bigger outcome. I think that's a beautiful point. That's cool. Yeah. Lisa. Are there really organic Oreos? Uh, Is that true? Isn't it Oreos that came out with organic Oreos? It was one of those weird I don't think they could ever foods. make an organic Twinkie. I don't even think that's oh. possible. Yeah, because right? I, I, I want to know what the filling is. <laughs> It's vegan. I do know Oreos are vegan. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> vegan yeah. what? I don't know. You know, I, I, think, um, I think what Joshua was saying about the, the ability of a company to influence, to create a need and then influence the world through that need goes back to your original question of can business really have a powerful impact on changing for the good? And I think, you know, yes, clearly because we see this, we see it happening, and we, we see that people are starting to vote with their dollars in a different way. And you know what Chris said is right, that we don't, we pay so little for food compared to everything else. People think nothing of spending $400 on a leased car a month. 
you know, but, but they guard every penny of the food budget, which I don't understand. It's so critical to who we are. It's so critical to our own personal health, and really on a bigger scale, it's critical to the health of the planet. And every single purchase you make, you're, you're making a choice of whether you're part of the problem or part of the solution. So again, um, I, really, I really loved that idea of it's not just about our companies here in this space, and it's not just about the, the companies in you know, the rarefied environment of Whole Foods Market, it's about what kind of an impact can we have with companies, in, in, with Costco, and with Walmart, and with the big companies, and with PepsiCo. That's huge, congratulations on that. So, yeah. I think you know, just creating demand for the regenerative model is just creating a new system that makes the old one obsolete, and we're seeing it unfold. Mm -hmm. I Bob like that. A yeah. <laughs> um, couple things. The Rodale study, it just coolest ever. I mean, it's it's you know empirical data now showing that this way of doing things matters, and when you get into just irrefutable facts and not necessarily emotion or Whatever, um, that, that's exciting, and, and definitely uh, more things like that are going to have, I think, a huge impact. Um, you know, and I just think with all of us, you know, creating these sticky brands and these brands that tell a good story, the quality's there, um, because, I mean, the passion that someone talks about, you know, all of your products, Oh my God! I mean, you know, so so if you know, the more people we can get out to, I mean, it's a it's a it's a cause, it's a passion. They're they're evangelists for what we're doing, you know, consumers or citizens. Um, so yeah, just these these sticky products that people are going around and tell. They're telling our story. People are you're telling our story and um, keep doing that. Yeah. Cool, Chris. Um, I liked how the uh, kind of like expand on that point you're like wow we did this and then it's in pepsi well you didn't do that you're just doing that because that's a value you hold and i feel like if we if we have a value and we just keep our heads down and plug through th things happen it starts to spread it makes that impact that you're wanting instead of think like i feel like you're more effective just doing it than to think about like well how impactive can i be what could i do to make an impact like just do it you know you really know what to do you just got to learn to listen Agreed, and I, I think that's what everyone is up to who decides to become an entrepreneur. Um, so I wanna just catch a moment on the whole energy of being an entrepreneur. Um, what, what about that do you think is the <laughs> strangeness of the individual? I mean, it's a, it's a strange thing to do in a lot of ways. It's certainly not following the pack. Um, how did, how did you decide that you were that person? You had to do this thing. You had to make a bar of soap, and you had to sell that bar of soap, and you didn't want to go work for Procter & Gamble who already made soap. You wanted to do your own thing. What, what was the trigger for you, each of you, but I'm sort of directing at you at the moment, Joshua. Well, you know, you're the bar of soap guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am a bar of soap. I am a bar of soap. <laughs> I think you know when I was when I was really young, and I think a lot of young people have this. You you feel like you know you were born into a world that you don't fit in, and I think it's because you were born into a world to create a new world mm. that you may or may not fit in, but you're going to create something that allows you to exist in this world where you feel like you're leaving a positive impact, and it's your own stamp of what you think is right and true and. You know, and it helps you kind of focus on this goal of just creation mm. and leaving something better than you found it, obviously. I love that. That's, I love the part of not feeling, feeling like it's completely matching up. So you're going to put a little piece of yourself into the equation to, you know, create your right livelihood mm -hmm. and a point of engagement. And then who knew that it would grow and others would really show up with you. And in some respect, that isn't even the motiva motivating force in the very beginning, is it? It's, I mean, it's partly there, but it's also, I just have to do this to be authentic. I just like the image of thousands of people taking a shower with something you that would. I make every like, morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do like that image. I think that piece of the authenticity is like, 
we weren't willing to mold into another shape. We wanted to do things how we wanted to do it, and you have these strong beliefs about it. And it's also one thing I'm sure we all are having to be comfortable with is being vulnerable, as in being like a figurehead for a business. You're displayed. I mean, you're being judged. And I mean, not that everyone isn't, but publicly. You know, you're really just kind of, this is me, this is who I am, and. You're kind of held to account. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's powerful. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, I, I come from a family of entrepreneurs. I don't think any of us are employable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I think this idea of having, you know, putting something out there, I mean, I still, whenever somebody buys um, my products, I get giddy. <laughs> it's like, this is so cool, you know, that like, this this idea you know appeals to you and you're willing to put your you know so that's that's pretty neat and just just one other thing though that um, sort of speaking for entrepreneurs I mean um, I I love I, I always say I use all parts of my brain every day you know creative strategic uh, pe dealing with people um, you know and that that for me is something that that's really great and just utterly stimulating. Um, all the time. Sometimes I cry a lot, but you know, it's, but it's all there, and it's and it's it's just fun. Thanks for admitting to the crying part. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, I'm not happy that you cry, but thank you for admitting that. Um, you know, I, I think it doesn't it doesn't always necessarily have to do with the end result. That sometimes the the idea of being an entrepreneur is just driven by the need to create. It's just that there's a, there's a passion around creating and there's a passion around making something happen. Just the sheer joy in the process of creating depends less on the end result and more on the process itself. Now, not to say that we don't all have, we're, we're all attached to the end result in some way or another because we want to make change, we want to make good, but I think the more we can stay with that creative process and be in that process, um, the better the product then ends up being. So how do you keep creativity alive? Because you know we're at this art fest, I mean this uh, music festival with a lot of artistic creative energy. Um, so in honor of that aspect, how do you keep creativity alive in your daily reality as you know inside of a business paradigm? I mean at Guayaquil, it's choose your own adventure. I mean, you, you can go to a surf competition or a mountain biking competition or a yoga festival, and it's up to the Sebador to steward that process and practice the art of connecting with whatever circle you may be in. So I think that really has enabled us to thrive and maintain a really high level of creativity and being able to share on multiple platforms that we never maybe considered in the past. And as we grow and bring in more people, it's just, we're constantly being inspired internally by one another. So it's, there's never been a lack of the creative spark. That's cool. That's uh, cool. For me, I, f I feel like, so as a business owner, creator, like you're, you're spending a lot of time in the world creating, like in this physical world. And so I like to spend time in my inner world and cultivate that too to create that balance as well as like taking care of myself so that I do have the energy to work 12 hours and do this and that and just be, ex uh, I mean, exhausted sometimes. And uh, so that knowing when I need to do something for myself to kind of compensate. And so kind of creative self-management sounds like. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of have to, no one's going to do it for you. And then, right. I mean, you're also doing it for your employees and you're doing it for your brand. So it's kind of like you're the head of this big family and you have to take care of yourself. You can't just always give, give, give. You got to really cultivate your inner self too. And then it just bleeds into the rest of your life. So. Yeah, I agree with that. Definitely keeping sanity through whatever um but uh but the other thing for me is is just getting out there like like i i just think i think i have five great new ideas from the last hour you know i mean <laughs> it's just everyone talking to everybody and and you know and i i always think it's like even when i go to a bad yoga class it's a good yoga class i still got something out of it like like always getting out there and always being open because every interaction i have with 
anyone, you know, there's an opportunity to learn something or to look at things in a different way. And um, so it's just, it's just being in it always. That's great. I love that. Anyone else have, how, do, how are you keeping creativity alive? For you, Joshua, you've been at this for a while. How do you keep it fresh? I doodle a lot. You doodle? Yeah, I just kind of like write ideas down. And I, I've kind of succumbed to the idea that out of 500 things that I create, which is a real number, one might launch, one might make it to market. And that's fine, because I still went through this amazing process of creating new formulas, researching new stem cell extracts, becoming uh, more interested in different parts of the world and how those ingredients are interacting with our skin. And you could, you know, the pessimist would say, well, you, you wasted your time on 499 products. And I said, no, I learned from the process of creating 499 things that now I have this really great thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a process, it's always a process, and it's always gonna be evolving. And I think that, what does that say? Time's up, 10 minutes? <laughs> I can't read, 10 minutes. <laughs> Is that for you to read? That's yeah. not just yeah. for you. I know. <laughs> uh, so I have 10 more minutes to yes, talk about you, this? You have okay. 10 more minutes so, to talk about <clears throat> no. 499. So let's start with the first one. Yeah. <laughs> So in 1999, no, I mean, I have, to, I have to be always creating. And I think that the big realization was it's okay to create things that are not going to launch, you know, and then I can just keep them in my bathroom and use them whenever I want. Right. And you have a title, so I know you're the founder, but I like your other title. You're like chief creative? Chief product officer. Chief, okay, chief product officer. That's fun. You wanted to say something? I, our... Um company is young enough that we're like constantly creating all the time so running out of creative force has not been a problem yet but you know I one of the things that I that I thought about when Linda made some comments was that I get giddy too when I see people buy our products I get really excited and I get really grateful I feel like I see somebody eat our product and somebody says oh my gosh this is so delicious I love this I live for these and I'm I get I, I'm just filled with this sense of gratitude and that really fuels me um, the other thing that we do is that one of our missions is to is especially to work with kids and help educate kids on on health and nutrition and I get so fired up and so inspired when I'm out in the field and I'm working with kids and I'm teaching kids and I just I look at I look at the amazement and the wonder on their faces and I and I see ways that we could actually be you know as we grow and as we get bigger I see where we can really make an impact a lasting impact on a, a much larger scale, so that fires me up. That's cool. So I'm, I love that we've talked about creativity, we've talked about climate change, and uh, we've talked about you know what it means to create right livelihood and a, a, a vibrant environment for your team to thrive as you're building your brands, and the, the whole power of having a true mission and purpose behind what you're doing so that it's not this sort of vapidness, it's actually meaningful, it's impactful. You're changing the world by existing and doing what you're doing, and I think that in and of itself is an extraordinary level of accomplishment for each one of you in what you're doing, and um, I'm so grateful to each of you for participating in this forum. Um, at the Epicenter is only as good as the wonderful people that we are able to attract and creating a dialogue that lives beyond just the singular event because we're filming today and this will end up going out and being shared hopefully many, many times as we drive the notion forward that business is a force for good when it decides to be, that a company can absolutely have an impact on a very broad scale. When you mentioned like 17 million acres of land that's being cultivated in different parts of the world, Joshua, that is creating the ingredients for your product, that is a very powerful concept that just one company is engaging with that amount of material on the planet that's being um, produced in a way that's not doing harm, that's creating right livelihood for the people on the ground in those different places. In Bangladesh, this incredible story of transformation. 
how exciting. I mean, who wouldn't want to drink Tetulia teas now that you've heard that story because you know that you're impacting the welfare and well-being of people on the other side of the planet, and that's a really beautiful thing. Guayaquil, growing forests, bringing hardwoods back, creating right livelihood for people. This is what excites and drives um, me forward in this quest to have conversations with people who are making a difference and getting to have engagement with you folks listening and being a part of this conversation by showing up. So thank you so much. Thank you to Arise Music Festival for welcoming at the Epicenter to do a program here. And I just want to thank each of you again, Joshua with Pangea Organics, Lisa with Holy Bites, Justin with Guayaquil, Linda, Tetulia Organic Teas, and Chris with WB Kitchen. Thank you so very much, and um, we'll hope to see all of you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Thank you.